Cells divide at the end of mitosis by forming a contractile ring of actin and myosin that generates a cleavage or cytokinetic furrow between the two daughter cells. But how do cells form the contractile ring at the right time and place? Ever since the 19th century, scientists have predicted that astral microtubules extending from the mitotic spindle poles play a key role in positioning the cleavage furrow. Most researchers agree that these microtubules deliver some sort of cytokinetic signal by touching the cell cortex, but many debates remain, as George von Dassau from the University of Oregon explains. There have been, of course, a number of long-standing arguments about where the microtubules are, how they behave, when they get where they are, and in what densities. We have been looking at cytokinesis and fixed cells, and I very much wanted to get into live imaging to resolve some of the kinds of questions that you simply can't get at with chemical fixation and immunolabeling. Bill Bement from the University of Wisconsin-Madison is also well aware of the controversies in the field. There's been this long-running debate about which pool of microtubules do what during cytokinesis. People came up with results that indicated that microtubules either stimulate or inhibit cytokinesis and that they're either more abundant at the equator where the cytokinetic apparatus will form or less abundant. So we thought the only way to find out is to actually look. Working together at the Friday Harbor Laboratories of the University of Washington, von Dassau and Bement set out to examine the microtubule dynamics of dividing cells in purple urchin, sand dollar and xenopus embryos. These cells are big, which means that positioning the cleavage furrow is particularly problematic. Their size also made it difficult to visualise microtubules, until the researchers used Ensconcin GFP, a microtubule label developed by Chloe Belinsky's lab. With this probe, they saw that microtubules reached every part of the cell cortex well before furrow initiation, but microtubules were less prominent in the region where the furrow formed. To investigate the role that stable microtubules might play in positioning the furrow, von Dassau and Bement added the depolymerizing drug nicodazole to the embryos. This treatment got rid of most of the astral microtubules, and those that remained didn't go anywhere near the cell surface. Yet to their surprise, the cells were still able to position their contractile rings and divide normally. To be quite honest, for about two or three weeks, we thought we were mistaken. We must be doing something wrong. But then as we kept getting the same result, it finally dawned on us that this is just how it is. So then that prompted us to turn to the TSA. TSA is trichostatin A, a drug that specifically disrupts astral microtubules while leaving the rest of the mitotic spindle intact. Unlike nicodazole, TSA doesn't arrest cells, so it can be added earlier in the cell cycle, preventing microtubules from touching the cell cortex at any point during mitosis. Despite this, the cells still managed to position the furrow and divide correctly. That was the big surprise, that without any apparent contact between the microtubule-based mitotic apparatus and the cell surface, they nevertheless establish a cleavage furrow in the right place, and that cleavage furrow progresses to completion. Cytokinesis isn't quite normal. The earliest marker of the cleavage furrow, active row GTPase, is localised more broadly in TSA-treated cells. Nevertheless, the cells can accurately cleave down their middle without microtubule asters. That apparently contradicts a lot of classical results, which suggest that it's the asters that pattern the cytokinetic furrow. The most notable of these is Rappaport's classic toroidal sand dollar egg experiment, in which he shows that the juxtaposition of two asters without any intervening spindle is the sufficient condition to induce a furrow. Von Dassau and Bement created cell fragments that only contained asters. No DNA, no central spindle. Sure enough, these too could undergo cytokinesis, but the process wasn't robust. It only occurred in cell fragments where the asters were far apart, closer to the cell surface than they were to each other. So, yes, even though otherwise we're showing that the asters aren't required to induce a furrow. Under some geometrical conditions, they are sufficient to induce one, which implies that the cell must be able to use several different spatial cues to set off this pattern formation process. In a lot of the classical literature on cytokinesis and continuing to the modern studies, people are trying to figure out the one thing that's essential. Perhaps that's the wrong approach. So in saying that contact from the mitotic apparatus to the cortex by microtubules isn't required, that doesn't mean it's not involved. 
To find out what the asters are doing, the researchers used a UV laser to destroy the spindle poles one at a time in sand dollar embryos. When a single pole was ablated, the cleavage furrow shifted away from the midzone and towards the missing centrosome. This suggests that asters don't stimulate cytokinesis because if they did, the furrow would move towards the one remaining centrosome instead of away from it. But von Dassau and Bement don't think the asters simply provide an inhibitory signal either. They found that in cells with one ablated centrosome, the total amount of row activity in the cleavage furrow stayed the same as normal, albeit more spread out. Strictly speaking, if it were a pure inhibition, uh, the total amount of row activity should be significantly increased. And that just was not the case. So basically, it was more like it was diluted. So we think it's not as simple as the asters inhibit the cytokinetic signal, but rather that they redistribute it. One possibility is that a positive cytokinetic signal is released from the central spindle, and that this is refined by astral microtubules, which somehow sweep the signal into position to generate a tight band of row activity at the cell equator. You might imagine that these things get released from the central spindle at anaphase onset, diffused through the cytoplasm, encounter astral microtubules, motor along them towards their plus ends, and thus end up getting swept continually toward the midplane between the two asters in normal cells. In the absence of asters, the positive signal can still diffuse to the equator, but its activity isn't as well focused. Really, we'd like to prove that it is diffusion. But of course, if you don't know what the signal is, that's kind of a tall order. The positive signal could be a complex of proteins called central spindling, which is thought to activate rho. But it could be something else, like chromosomal passenger complex that contains the Aurora B kinase. Either way, it seems that multiple spatial cues combine to accurately and precisely position the cytokinetic furrow. I think that we have to get away from this kind of either-or thinking. Why wouldn't the cell use the chromosomes or the central spindle or the centrosomes or the astromicrotubules as spatial cues to refine the cytokinetic pattern? Perhaps we can dissect out how these different cues synergize instead of trying to dismiss one or the other of them as not the most important thing for the process. You can read more about how astral microtubules don't need to touch the cell cortex, yet still contribute to accurate cytokinesis, in the paper by von Dassau et al. in the December 14th edition of the Journal of Cell Biology.